Hey everybody, welcome to Shaper Sessions. My name is Jake and today we're going to be taking it back to the basics and doing one of my favorite projects, the candle holder. Now the candle holder is a premium project that you can download for free. Normally premium projects are a paid service that we provide, but this particular project is free and it's designed to help you get started with Origin. So I really encourage people to use this as a first time project. Uh, it's small, it's accessible, you can make it out of scrap wood, um, and it's a really good learning opportunity. So as if the instructions themselves aren't beautifully clear enough, we're going to make it today. So we're going to go through, we're going to answer any questions, um, and we're going to talk about little tips and tricks along the way. The other reason I like this is it's totally customizable. Whatever size your candle is, or little flares that you want to add to it, you can do, and we'll talk about that. So this is a premium project page. We have all the information, some, some nice beauty shots of the project, what you're going to learn, what you're going to need, tools, material, things like that. And the purchase of this project is free, so you still go through the process of purchasing even though it costs zero dollars. And then once you do that, it will bring you to a page that gives you Oh, we have Mr. Josh Worley there. <laughs> so once you purchase the project, you can carry on to there we go. This is all our different premium projects that we have downloaded. And this is kind of the home page of the premium project. Now if you actually jump back to the, our premium project list real quick, Goose, we got a couple up here that are also really awesome. And I'm starting with this bench brush, or I'm sorry, this um, candle holder specifically because it's a good intro project. But the reason we created premium projects and the reason we push uh, other creators to really create awesome PDFs to go along with their community projects is because it really helps people learning to learn the tool. I mean, we're making a tool that's never been made before. so. Education is a really big deal for us, and we put a lot of effort into making sure that we can teach this thing, and we put out as much information out there as we can. So through our venues like Sessions here, through our Instagram, and through our videos, and through our community, we try to make this a really uh, prosperous learning environment so we can all teach each other how to use this awesome tool. So that being said, once you kind of move on from this project, I encourage you to keep looking throughout the premium projects and through some of the uh, community projects that have, well, all the community projects, but some of which have really in-depth PDFs that go along with them. Some that are coming to mind, we have the Bench Brush, which is actually a premium project, but a really nice step-by-step, -step, a lot of handwork in there as well. Um, I would call that an intermediate to an advanced project. We have on the free side of things, uh, Ted will post it in the chat, a link to it, but we have the Elate Lamp. Again, more on the uh, intermediate, advanced scale, but there's a lot of really intricate part building, and seeing how that lamp comes together is really beautiful, and it's amazing documentation. And then also we have something that we put forth, the uh, Trestle Bench, which is a uh, PDF that you can just download and gives you a step-by-step -step on how to build the Trestle Bench, which is a really fun project so if you were looking to go a little bit bigger scale and make a piece of furniture that's a good place to start all right back to our home page page please goose all right so one of the coolest things we won't pull it up right now but I just want to point out you can always pull out your technical drawings for any premium project so if you're learning to have if you're looking to have a better understanding of the scale of this project downloading those technical drawings and just getting at it, okay, this is my material size, this is my overall footprint, that's a great place to start. You have your uh, bill of materials, so that's going to tell you what kind of lumber you need to get, what additional tools. So for this project, I believe our material, I'm going to stray away slightly from our instructions today, but I will show how to originally do it. So it's telling us we need a roughly 8 inch by 22 inch piece of hardwood and some MDF as a spoil board, tells you your bits, origin of course, double-sided tape, so on and so forth. 
then of course you have your 2D cutting files that you can download and that will sync directly to your origin provided that it, it is uh, hooked up to your Wi-Fi and 3D, 3D files so if you want to bring it into a 3D CAD software you can do that as well alright so number one on the project list when you open up those project instructions there's 26 steps in this pro pro project and each one is really in depth so we're just going to go through them together first one is your workspace setup I'm going to kind of show you the written explanation or how they describe how to make this tool or how to make this project but I am actually going to be making it on the workstation and that's also what I love about this project it calls for a piece of 8 by 22 roughly uh, piece of material that's so that it's big enough for you to put origin on top of it and that origin has enough room to ride around if you happen to also purchase workstation you can work a lot smaller and this is why we never throw scraps away at Shaper. We have a big bin full of scraps like this. These things are not useless. These can be candle holders because they're the perfect thickness and they fit right on my shelf. And I can adjust that height of the shelf and I can work really small and still have a nice big footprint for origin to ride on. So something like this is perfect. So I have some walnut, some sapele, but I found this piece of hickory and I just thought it was beautiful so we're gonna make a can to hold her out of hickory today all right so if you hop over those instructions I want to read them with you first we have place a spoil board on your workbench it's saying that to use a piece of uh, eighth inch thick MDF that's a great spoil board. Typically we have half inch to three quarter uh, spoil boards laying around. It's just what we have. It's a little bit more stable. And, but eighth inch, you know, if you're working in a small, small space, it's also a lot cheaper to get. That's fine. It's a spoil board. You're going to cut into it. That's the whole point. So you want something that's low cost and um, you're able to replace as often as you need to. All right, step two. Fix your material to your spore board. Hopefully, you have a roll of our amazing double-sided tape, which we sell on our store. There's a reason we sell it, because it's the best stuff out there. It really is. I, don't, I, I feel bad for anyone trying to use carpet tape, anything with like that really strong fiber in there. It's going to gunk up your bits. It's going to mess it up. So something like this, it's easy to cut through, but also has a really nice hold is definitely the way to go. So it wants you to make a really strong connection making sure that you wherever you plan on placing your file for the candle holder I want to make sure that there's a lot of double-sided tape underneath that so that when we cut through it's not going to break free. And since this is a longer piece maybe just throw an additional piece up there just so it doesn't scoot around on us. Now this tape is pressure sensitive. So when you place it down, it's very important to press firmly. If you are uh, if I'm doing a large project, I will literally get on top of it and like put my entire body weight down because that's really it really makes that seal. And we don't want things cutting loose on us. All right, we are affixed. Apply shaper tape. Typically, I like to teach placement of shaper tape is always um, perpendicular to your direction. So if you're facing this way, your shaper tape is going across out in front of you. That's just a general best practice, but it's not necessary. So if I'm working on a long board like this, it is totally okay to take your shaper tape and string it down the length. It's a lot faster than putting out little strips along the way. 
Still, you know, I'm, when I'm doing this kind of fashion, I'm probably going three inches on center. And note that I am pulling my shaper tape out nice and steadily, placing down both ends, and then pressing down. A lot of, I see a lot of people want to do this, and that actually introduces little curves in it. Again, best practice, try not to do that. All right, this is where we would diverge from our instructions, but this is how you would set it up in if you did not have workstation. Clamp this down to your workbench and you're ready to cut. I'm gonna set this aside because I'm working on a smaller piece like this. I'm gonna quickly throw some double-sided tape on it. And same thing with our spoil board, our larger spoil board of here. The shelf on the workstation is a spoil board. You're meant to cut into it. You're meant to be able to replace it. That's why there's instructions on how to make new ones in your workstation manual. Doo -doo -doo. All right, I have that shelf clamped so I can press down firmly. Nice, good pressure. Notice that I'm affixing my piece to my shelf before I set my height. I want to make sure it's exactly where I need it to be and um, I can bring it back down and adjust the height now. It also accounts for the thickness of the double sided tape, which is minimal but worth noting. All right, I put my support bar into its locking position, just slides into those notches there and I can bring my material up so that it contacts that shelf or that support bar. Lock it into place. Good to go. I just slightly tune these. This is just applying a slight bit of pressure on the back side of my spoil board. But now I have nice level surface for the right on. Okay. Bring my laptop a little closer. Next step, number four. Let's scan. Scan our workspace workspace. And start up on that right hand side and hit new scan. I always like to start in the top left create habits like this and you'll guarantee yourself good scans every time. Nice and steady overlapping each pass. Getting a good image of my material. Tap that green button and let it do its magic. On to step five the grid. So we're going to make a grid the right way, the best way, which is using the engraving bit backwards. So go ahead and slide your spindle out. Take that engraving bit and put the sharp side in first, just so that the solid quarter inch shank of the engraving bit is sticking out. And you just need to get that finger tight. Again, we're not turning our spindle on, so. What is important, however, is you want to tighten the spindle screw on the side, because we're going to use that as a probe. All right, in our design tab, we're going to hit that grid button. There we go. Oops. And grid, new. And lower and down just so my bit is below the material. There we go. Probe one, probe two, 
probe too. Now I'm just making light contact here. I'm not pressing hard against my material. And probe three using the side of that bit. There we go. Now I need to Pardon me while I sign into my account. Yeah, hop off of that. Thank you. It's always fun when you uh, are in a shared shop. You gotta sign in and sign out to everyone's Shaper account. And there we go. All right. So I'm doing things a little different because I'm working sideways on my project and in the instructions it has you working long ways, but it's okay. It's just as easy to figure it out. It wants you to make, uh -huh, okay. So I'm gonna go to my import tab, my premium files. I'll do that again real quick. Import and premium, and here are all my premium projects. Grab that candle holder, 2D cutting files, imperial, and there we go. Now, because I'm working sideways on a smaller piece, I'm gonna rotate 90 degrees. and place it on my material. Now, that center line, we're going to be working off that center line quite a bit. So it's important to remember where that is because we are actually creating the circles for our candles. So we can head on over to step number seven. Hit that Create tab and select your circle. Now, this is where we need to have our tea light. We're going to start by making that. So grab your tea light. And now comes my first tool recommendation, a pair of digital calipers. Doesn't you know? You don't need to have the fanciest kind. I say just buy something that uh, is affordable. I prefer digital because we're putting in <laughs> we're putting in a decimal point number here so makes it a lot easier if you just can read a decimal point number but if you're a dial caliper person more power to you all right i'm measuring a diameter of 1 1.47 1.4 i'm going to do 8 1.48 to give myself a little bit of wiggle room. All right. So first thing I'm running into, I need to change my grid size. And that is all right. I believe it's an eighth inch grid, but I can go ahead and modify the one I have existing to an eighth inch. Go back to create and make that 1.48 inch circle. There we go. Now you can see I'm on my Y axis is 1.5, which is exactly where I want to be. And I'm just dragging that to be centered in that area. Tap the green button and we're placed. On, on over to step number eight. We're doing a second circle for our smaller candle. Now, I don't have a smaller candle, but this is designed for like one of those long stick candles. So I'm just going to assume that looks about three quarters of an inch. 0.76. Yep. 0.76. Staying on that y-axis of 1.5, I'm just scooting over. 
and this there you go so we've created our two on tool circles for our actual candles on over to step number nine where we're going to start cutting we got a couple of big shapes here so we want to hollow them out the way to do the way to do that is to pocket first so pocketing is the only time that origin kind of acts like a traditional router it allows you to travel <coughs> travel any direction but it won't let you travel outside of your shape in addition it kind of gives you a buffer um, of about half your bit diameter so whenever we pocket something we also also have to cut the inside of it so you rough out the inside of the shape then you do a nice clean pass on the inside with an inside cut so on my cut menu you can see it's assuming that I'm in an inside cut but I in fact want to change that to a pocket and I'll come over here to my other one and do the same pocket and just so you have an illustration of what I was talking about it's allowing me to go any direction that also being said it's up to me not to climb cut now climb cutting is when you go in the direction of the rotation of the bit you'll feel it because it'll start to uh, bite a little bit and you'd rather go against the direction of the bit for circles it's really easy you kind of start in the center and spiral your way out but I think first we need to put a bit in starting off with our standard quarter inch two flute up cutter uh, I'll just so in your tool bag you'll be able to find this gives us all the depth we need three quarters of an inch depth and I'm going to chuck that up now there's nice grooves cut into this bit and I want you to clamp it up into the collet right where that groove stops just sneak it up to that point don't go any further and you don't need it sticking out super far this way you have a minimal amount of only the usable part of the bit is is sticking out and don't forget to tighten that up plug it in and we need to z-touch so I'm directly on top of my material it already thinks I have a quarter inch bit in there so that's fine so I can automate I can just hit the manual z-touch button take your hands off the tool let it do its work bingo now I know where zero is all right next step I gotta figure out my final depth this candle is 0.64 inches deep so let's do yeah, 0.64 I like it just for uh, so everyone can see measuring that depth 0.64 probably pick up tea lights at your local hardware store I went to our local grocery store and they had some nice lavender scented ones so I'm not going to do that in one go because that's a really deep cut and I'm also working in particularly hard material like a hickory down here also wouldn't recommend necessarily starting with a super dense wood like that start with a softer wood like poplar um, and get more comfortable with how origin works then also when you're working with harder woods it definitely helps to have a nice sharp bit so I'm using a fresh bit in here or a bit that you've cleaned really really well and doesn't have a ton of miles on it so I'm gonna do that in a couple of depth passes start with my quarter inch pass general rule of thumb whatever your bit diameter is should be the maximum depth you do per pass that doesn't really apply when you're using like an inch bit I wouldn't want you to go and try to do an inch deep cut but generally quarter inch diameter quarter inch depth eighth inch diameter eighth inch depth 
so on and so forth. All right, I'm going to pocket these down to 0 0.65, 0 0.64. Goose is messing me up. <laughs> Did I say 4.6 or 6.4? Let's see. 0.64. Haha. <laughs> All right, 0.64. Safety glasses, hearing protection, and dust collection. Ready to go. So I'm going in a clockwise direction, which is against my rotation of the bit. Overlapping my cut as well. Dragging that final one on the outside, and you can see that, that gap built in there. Okay. I'm going to scoot over to here. Nice. Next one, we're going to go down to half. That last pass on the outside edge really just kind of like dragging it along the boundary. Quick body language tip, or rather, you know, Suppose body language, yeah. Uh, when I'm doing motions like that, especially tight motions, and I'm cutting a dense material, instead of having my hands floating and just kind of rigidly attached to my body, I'm actually planting the sides of my hands on workstation or on my, there you go. So that, that side of the hand is planted and I'm driving a lot with my fingers. Not delicate like this, so I still have a nice firm grip on the handle, but these the side of my hand really anchors me down and allows me greater control. When I'm doing larger sweeping cuts, that's when I'm more connected to origin and I'm taking it along with me. All right, we've roughed out our circles. Our T-Light's not going to fit yet because there's that built-in offset there to keep us from um, accidentally nicking the inside of our of our circle. That offset really is there because pocketing can sometimes be a more aggre more of an aggressive cut. So we want to make sure if something happens, if you climb cut, you don't accidentally damage the inside of your circle. So on to step number 10. We are switching it to inside cuts. All right. Now on those instructions too, I want to point out that you can always hit the cut settings drop down menu. There you go, Goosey. And it's going to give you all the necessary information. Cut depth, which is different for us. Cut type, offset, so on and so forth. All right, hovering back over my, my shapes, going to change the cut type. 
from a pocket to an inside. There we go. And there we go. Let's cut this. Voila. Nice clean hole, and let's test our candle. Beautifully snug fit. Kind of that piston feel. That is what I was looking for. Great. Now, that finish cut was relatively aggressive, uh, especially based on the fact that I'm using dense hickory. Um, so coming from a pocket with a quarter inch bit that's leaving you an eighth of an inch away from your final cut line. So that last pass I just did was full depth of 0.64 inches, cutting off an eighth of an inch all the way around. And it was fine. Again, sharp cutter, st steady hands. If you are looking to get a little bit more, that finish cut to be a little bit easier, go ahead and give yourself an offset. I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm going to clear this momentarily. So instead of going straight to zero from that pocket, go ahead and give yourself like a 0 0.02 offset. That's just a hair away from your final design line, but it will allow you to, again, take, that, take the meat of that inside cut away and then come back to a zero inch offset and do a really easy finish cut. All right, on to step number 11. We're gonna take that same process that we just did, the pocket and the inside cut, to the center section, which is for matchsticks. I wanna double check what depth they have us here. Okay, they say to a point final, final depth of 0.32, and I think I might go a little deeper just so I can fit a few more matchsticks. Again, the beauty of this project is you can decide what you want to do. So I'm going to go down to half inch in two depth passes.
just holding that green button on the right and pausing origin and letting it do the fine work. Beautiful. I apologize for the audio. I'm talk I'm over here talking the whole time and apparently you couldn't hear me. But All right, I'm going to fix my mic here real quick. Sorry about that, folks. Test test. All right. So I'm going to test the um my little match tray. And that feels like a good depth. It's going to hold a couple more matches for me. There we go. Whoops. All right. So I was glad I put that offset, that 0 0.02 offset, when I was coming in to do my inside cut, because whoever whoever uh, had the tool before me had their auto speed set up. Typically, I'm running my auto speed on the default setting which is 10 inches per minute. But if for whatever reason you need, to, you need to change your auto or plunge speed, you can change it right here by hitting that speed stab. Again, 10 inches per minute is that default, and 15 is default for the plunge. I find that's great for most things. Anytime I, the only reason I ever bump my speed up for auto is if I'm doing things like text engraving or maybe doing a lot of holes. So if I'm doing a helical hole, I might want to speed that up just a hair. All right, on to the next step. Finish cuts up. Well, I jumped ahead. I already did my finish cuts. And check your cuts. I'm really happy with how, with how they all came out. I'm not seeing any burning because I got a fresh bit. I'm not running too high of a speed on my spindle. I am running about four and a half, possibly. Um, I feel comfortable in that range, maybe up to five, depending on what I'm cutting. But if you start seeing burning on areas like this, you either need to clean your cutter or turn your spindle speed down. Really no reason to be running it at a six, which is full speed. Um, typically it's just going to go through your cutters a little faster. So bring that down, especially as you're learning, it's easier to start with a slow spindle. On to step 14. We're starting with that outer profile cut. That offset's going to come back into play here because the whole outside, our rough cut, as I like to call it, is going to have a point oh. Well, let's check our cut settings. Point oh 0.02. That's my favorite offset. Again, if you want a little bit more room for mistakes or things that might happen, just make that offset a little bit bigger. 0 0.03, 0 0.04, it's totally fine because you're just going to take it all away in your finish pass. All right, we're doing this in three cuts. Quarter inch, half inch, and 0.7 inches. Not all the way through. We're leaving a thin skin of about 0 0.05. And a very good reason for that. Uh, part of your cut where you started. There's 
puck through and end up making the piece. dust in there. Sweet. All right, on the step 15, finish cuts, we're taking that offset away and we're coming into our final diameter, final dimension on the outside, but we're still not cutting all the way through. We're leaving about a 0.05 skin on the bottom. This is a really good tactic whenever you're cutting small things. I would say this is on the s this is more along on the size of safe. Uh, it's large enough and has enough surface area to really stick down with double-sided tape. But as things get smaller and smaller, their surface area is less and less, and the f you know just the sheer force of origin is enough enough to knock it free from the double-sided tape, and then you lose your part. So. What we're doing in this process is creating tabs, which is a really handy process that you just chisel away later and sand flush, and it keeps everything nice and secure. So on to our finish pass. Going nice and steady on this one. I don't even want to sit down for it. I'm going nice and steady. Like I said, I even sat down for this one, so I'm in total control. This is going to be my final cut quality. On to step 16, we're cruising through it. Check cuts, make sure that everything looks good and happy. We're leaving that thin skin of 0.05 in the bottom just so nothing breaks loose. Oh, the chamfer step. This is a fun little trick using the engraving bit. So in your kit comes that 60 degree engraving bit. We're gonna use that as a chamfer. So it looks like that. So we're going to pop out our quarter inch cutter. And put in the engraving bit. Boom, spindle tight plugged in and I'm coming over to the area where I have a little bit more material because I have to Z-touch again. Tell the tool that I'm using a quarter in, or an engraving bit, Z-touch, hands off the tool. Bingo. All right, let's open that cut settings menu. Just get a look at what we're looking at. We are using an offset of five thousandths, which is conveniently a preset, and a cut depth, very specific, 0 0.095. And you can see that cut path is now really small on the outside.
and we're just doing it around the outside of the perimeter. I can turn my spindle down for this one because we're just using the engraving bit. think that looks great. If I wanted to, I could keep going with that chamfer and I could do the chamfer on the inside of the tray, uh, but I'm going to keep it just on the outside. I think that looks really nice. All right, finishing cuts back to our quarter inch cutter. So we do all this stuff beforehand just to make sure that it's done so that if it does break loose, we can just sand anything that was left. I don't want it to break loose. All right. Quarter inch bit, quarter inch bit back in. And Z touch making sure the tool is on a nice solid surface. Zero inch offset and our depth is 0.7, I'm going to do 6, 0.76 because I want to make sure I'm actually cutting all the way through and slightly into my spoil board um, and my material is 0.75. Now, we're going to be cutting very little material, but we're also going to be starting and stopping the cut. So I'm going to do myself a little favor here. I'm going to clear my cut history just so I can see it even clearer where I've started and stopped. So you do that by hitting that little eraser. Boom. Now it's like I haven't done anything. And I'm going to leave three little tabs around the perimeter of my piece to hold it into place. So that's nice and secure still, which is great. I can actually pry it up. Let's see what it has us doing next in step 20. Use a chisel. I like it. Grab a small chisel. Just cut through that last bit of material. We're going to sand anything off that was left over. Put this trick in your back pocket for any time you're doing really small things, especially like butterflies or any kind of small, um, but small but thick things, I should say. 
when you're working really thin material you don't have to worry about this too much all right second tool on my recommended tool list a flexible putty knife something metal um, I even go to the extent of taking mine to the grinder and sharpening it up because I want to be able to get under my material and pry it up without damaging it and I have a habit of putting too much double-sided tape on when I do sessions because the last thing I want is for something to cut loose but just by wiggling it in there like so I can twist it and voila and same thing over here wiggle my way in twist and voila if it was giving me any more trouble I could have brought in this guy the third tool I'll recommend it's called the Titan flat bar we like it because it's thin it's thin and sharp and actually can help get under something and pry up this is my favorite things list all right you see those those tabs just pop right off I can start sanding anything that was left over but I'm very happy with that for a very dense wood too now I have a hickory tea light candle what else we got I'm gonna pry it out we're gonna sand the faces we're gonna delicately sand the chamfer that we put on there I'll come up here to the bench camera just to show what I'm talking about that really subtle chamfer it's really nice to be able to do that with origin too is just very convenient Uh, I believe Ted should post all the links to the tools that I've been recommending so far in the chat, so keep an eye out for that. All right, step 24 through 26, we got sanding, finishing, and enjoying. Uh, let's see what kind of finish he recommends using. Avoid pools of oil gathering in the hard to reach area. That's a good, good tip. Um, because it is a candle holder, I'd probably stay on the more natural side uh, and stay away from something too flammable. So a mineral oil, things like that um, are going to be safe. But yeah, after I sand this up, put a coat of oil on it, good to go. Great way to turn scraps into gifts. That's what we're all looking for, right? Easy projects that help us learn and get better at tools and also allow us to get the stuff to our friends and family. Oh, where's the candle? There it is. Bingo. I don't have this candle, but I will put some matches in there. Voila. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining.